she, you know, she tall, she big, right? <laughs> we all you, know, you know what I mean? I don't know. I mean, I would have guessed she was like four or five months. I don't, I don't think she's like eight, seven, eight months. I don't know. What's our time? I was 6.44, I got about a minute, right? She was texting me sitting on the way to the hospital. Oh, did she? Yeah, she was probably one of All right, that's fine. My message is pretty. Samaya! <laughs> Hi, Q. Samaya, thanks for doing my hair. <laughs> So we're going to get started soon. Hey, Lawrence, thanks for everybody logging in. I'm so excited. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts today, guys. Thanks to you, Samaya. Thank you. Um, all right, let's... All right, good, because I might run over. We'll see. Might run over? I said I might run over. We'll see. Hmm? I said I might run over a few seconds, but we'll see. Do that. What you doing? <laughs> Get ready to enjoy the BFF experience. So you enjoy your vacation? Harris, as she yeah. you a wealth of knowledge. Work vacation. Right? Okay, right. I'm ready. Right. Let me play one more drive real quick. All right. Spiritual Connect Radio. Okay. We're about, to we about to go live, so. Hey, 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 everybody. It's your girl, Christina Harris, here on Business, Faith, and Family. You're tuned in to Spiritual Connect Radio. Um, I want to thank you for tuning in, everyone who's watching on um, live or listening to the radio. Um, first and foremost, I want to just remind you guys to keep everyone in prayer with this hurricane that's coming on. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot going on. So I just want to remind you guys to prayer works. You know what I mean? Prayer definitely works. So let's do, let's be faithful. Um, continue to give, to continue to give if you can. However, be wise with your giving. Be wise with your giving. And as I said, um, to pray is free. To pray is free. So tonight we're going to talk about um, spiritual gifts. And this topic is, it's, I always feel like there's no neutral ground when we talk about spiritual gifts. Either it's always um, overly emphasized or underemphasized. So tonight we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. And the Word of God always says, like, once you know you're accountable, um, for what you're knowing. So tonight is important for me to, I want to go over each spiritual gift. I want to go over examples of the gift. I want to build you up so that you know you are anointed with um, your spiritual gifts if you're saved. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, first and foremost, the, when I talk about spiritual gifts, we're, this more so pertains to believers. And the reason I say that is because once you get saved, the Holy Spirit imparts a gift in you. So you have to be saved in order to um, um, have the spiritual gift because the spiritual gift isn't necessarily even yours. It's actually the Holy Spirit imparting a gift in you, but it's always for the glory of God and the helping of other people. It's God manifesting himself in you through that gift. So the gift really doesn't belong to you. You know, you may, you have to be a good steward over it. But again, it's God manifesting himself into you through that gift. That's very important. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives the gifts. The Holy Spirit is the one who assigns the believer the gifts. Okay. So we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. I hope that you can watch or tune in for the entire time because it's some really good stuff that God had um, put together for you guys. So I always tell people now last week we did second Timothy where Paul said, don't be, um, for God didn't give you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, right above that, 
Paul had encouraged Timothy to fan into flames the spiritual gifts that the Lord has given you. So I want to remind you that um, don't be fearful. You know, when you God didn't leave all the burden on you. He's just asking you to be available. That's it. He's the one who in part take um, the power in you, the anointing, you know, sometimes he even draw the people to you. God does more than you to be very honest. So when Paul said, don't be afraid, don't be fearful, you know, don't be afraid to allow God to use you. If you are saved, you have a spiritual gift. It's your job to develop that gift. It's your job to, um, you know, really ask God to show you your gifts. They have spiritual gift tests that you can take in the church online for free. So after this um, message, you can go ahead and find your spiritual gift. They got a little, you know, a few questions and things like that. If you're going to take the spiritual gift, um, I recommend the spiritual gift test. I recommend that you um, pray first. And just ask God to reveal you, reveal to you your gifts so you know which direction to, you know, go in in your ministry. So the first thing I wanted to um, remind you guys is don't be afraid of your gift. Don't be afraid to allow God to use the gift that he gave you. There's a story in the Bible about the different talents. And um, God had given, you know, a few people talent. And some had used those talents and... Um, yield fruit in their life. And there was one guy who did nothing with the talent, um, absolutely nothing. So I don't want you to be that person. Again, you're accountable for everything you're taught. So tonight I'm teaching you, if you're saved, you have a spiritual gift. It's your job to discover what it is and it's your job to allow God to move in your life so he can use those gifts through you. So again, tonight we're going to talk about the different gifts. I'm going to go in depth. As I said, the um, your spiritual gifts is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit who's moving in your life. Um, I said the Holy Spirit is the one who gives the gifts. And I want to read this to you real quick. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11 real quick for you guys. It says, now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the spiritual abilities the Spirit gives, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along and worshiping speechless idols. So I know you, I know you want, sorry, so I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same God. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Y'all get that? Don't miss that. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. I'm going to read that again. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another person, the spirit, that same spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same spirit gives great faith to another and someone else, the one spirit giving um, of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to, the, to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. That's referring to tongues. While another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Now, and I want to park right there for one second. Remember, as we just read that, he put a lot of emphasis on the same spirit would give this gift, would give this gift of healing. The same spirit will give this gift of prophecy. So remember, it's the Holy Spirit who performs, I mean, who gives you these gifts. And last, I want you to remember what he just said. Um, 
Um, I lost my train of thought. Hold on. Uh, oh, it's all for the glory of God, pretty much. All right? It's not for your glory. It's all for the glory of God. And it's the Holy Spirit who decides your gift. It's not your grandmother. It's not your mother. As much I've heard people say to little two-year-olds, oh, he's going to be a pastor. He's going to be this. He's going to be that, you know. And um, that's not for them to decide, you know. It's up to the Holy Spirit. You don't even get saved at two years old, you know what I mean? So how can you determine someone's spiritual gifts? Um, so, and I want to just mention this. You know, during the time of Christ, when Christ came, it's interesting how, for example, um, when you were, when you was given the spiritual gift of preaching the gospel, you know, there was a lot of persecution during that time. Hey, Rashida, um, there was a lot of persecution during that time. And I can imagine, you know, this is me and my imagination. I can imagine in all transparency, the apostles and um, the disciples of Christ, you know, for them to have to go forth under such cultural um, persecution, it probably wasn't a, a lure to have that gift. You know, though they went out in a gift and they were bold because of the spirit in them, but it wasn't an allure perhaps. But it's interesting, like now everybody wants to be a pastor. But I can imagine like back then, you know, it's like, they was probably like, oh, man, I got this gift. Want to exchange? How about I, you know, you take this gift and I'll take the gift of hosp hospitality, you know. But I say all that to say this. Ultimately, God decides who gets what gifts. The Holy Spirit decides who gets what gift. And I always say, don't be so quick to want somebody else gifting because you won't have the grace to go with it. It's important to stay in your own lane, to stay in your own gifting ability. You know, I know there, I know when we watch um, huge platforms such as, you know, T.D. Jakes and Joyce Myers, and we like, oh my God, you know, they have so much charisma and they have this big ministry and all of that. But work on what God has given you. You know, if your gift is to be home and raise your children to be godly people as they grow, God gave you the gift for that. Don't don't see sometimes even as Christians, we can get into the comparison, you know, and that's why just how Paul said he kept an emphasis on is the same spirit who gives all these gifts. We're all shooting for the same. We all should be shooting for the same goal, which is to glorify the same God. That's it. So don't get too, you know, caught up when we start comparing who has this gift and this anointing. Just stay, make sure you are operating in your gift. Hey, Siobhan, make sure you are operating um, in your fullest capacity and allowing God to use you. So let's get into the gifts. Um, I pray that you um, allow God to minister and reveal something in you that will only be confirmation, to be honest. You know what I mean? So the gift of wisdom, I'm going to read the definition so we can be precise. It says to apply knowledge to life in such a way as to make spiritual truths quite relevant and practical and proper decision making in daily life situations. It says godly wisdom based on God's word. You know, if I could put a face with a name, you know who would probably have this gift of wisdom would be um, Solomon right? Solomon had the gift of wisdom, you know, um, the apostle Paul, he was the one, he also had the gift of wisdom. And, um, there's different ways you can use this gift. You can use, and, and let me just break it down. Basically what it's saying is you have the gift of wisdom. When things happen to you in life, you are able to correspond it with the word of God and learn from it. You know what I mean? And apply that truth. And now you're, you know, for example, if you went through a marriage um, and you got a divorce. So now you're able to apply the word of God, which tells you, hey, you know, wait for the right one. You know, you learn, you know what I mean? Um, wait for the right one. Now you're able to minister to others and say, listen, based on my experience, I want to encourage you to allow God to pick your mate, you know what I mean? So you don't get divorced or something like that. So, um, again, it's God who 
will allow you to have wisdom out of your situation. And there are, even though we might think that's common sense, no. The reality is there are people who will go through the same cycle over and over again. You can't keep going to the bar on Friday and Saturday looking for Mr. Right um, because when you guys get settled down or whatever, you're going to despise the fact that he still keeps going to the bar. You know, so um, again, just wait for God to give you wisdom. If you have this gift, there's different ways you can use the gift of wisdom. Um, and counseling, that, that would be an awesome way, even if it's Christian counseling. Even if it's not formal, you know, you get the certification and things like that. You could be a counselor to your friends and family, you know, just a good listener and someone who applies truth to their lives, you know. Um, so there's another way you can do things um, with this gift. Crisis intervention, someone who may be suicidal or, you know, those or um, um, domestic violence outreaches and things like that. You can apply the wisdom of God, whatever he imparts in you to other people during those times of their crisis, you know. And a lot of you may already be doing this. You know, you may be the go to person everyone calls when, you know, when their world is kind of upside down, you know, so you already may be operating in that gift of wisdom. Um, so that was the gift of wisdom. We're going to go over the gift of knowledge. It says, um, word of knowledge, the ability to have an in-depth understanding of a spiritual issue or situation to seek to learn as much as possible about the Bible as possibly through the gatherings of much information and the analyzation of the data. Um, ways to use this gift, you know, you could be a, te a, Bible, um, a Bible teacher, you know, Sunday school teacher, a preacher, a speaker. Um, hey, you can even post on Facebook, you know, little Bible truths. You know, is we in 2017, so not everything is always going to be in church. You know, actually, God would prefer you to um, allow him to use you in the secular world, in the setting that you're always in. We only go to church once or twice a week for the most of us. For, for some of us, we don't go at all. But you can still allow God to use you in those um, other areas of your life. So um, with the you can have Bible study with your kids and your husband or your wife um, or your co-workers, Miss Hope. Um, a good friend of mine, she goes to work and she has Bible study with her coworkers. You know what I mean? Those people may never step, step foot in the church, but she take her gift to her workplace, you know? So you're not restricted as to where you, God would prefer you be bold enough and courageous enough um, and available to allow him to be in those other areas of your life, you know? So that's the gift of knowledge. Uh, which is one of my spiritual gifts. You know, I spend a lot of time studying the word of God. That doesn't mean you know everything. This, by no means. The Bible says much is given, much is required, first of all, you know. And um, it seems like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Because there's so many depth. It's like an, it's, knowledge is so deep. You know what I mean? So with knowledge, you also have to be humble. You know, it's not for you to, because I always say this, and I've experienced this before. I've experienced reading my Bible and, you know, learning the word of God and becoming arrogant in a sense. You know what I mean? So this is something you definitely have to be careful of. Um, you have to be careful of and you have to stay humble, stay close um, to Christ and his heart. Because at the end of the day, God's not going to be impressed with how much of the word you memorize, know, preached or anything. If you have a bad heart and you don't love the people that he sends in your life. You know what I mean? Your heart is what is more important to God than any word you can deliver. All right. So always put that at the forefront as um, as I stress to you guys, you know, I encourage you all. I pray for you all that you continue to allow God to make you whole. You know, the more you allow God to make you whole, the more you um, discover yourself. You know what I mean? You discover your purpose. 
you know, your gifts, your passion, all of that is there. So you can always allow God to make you whole one area at a time. And trust me, it's work. But if you got somebody willing to put in a work with you, why not take that offer? It's like when you go to the gym, if you got somebody saying, hey, I know you're obese, but I'm willing to be at that gym with you. Every, you know, every other day, I'm willing to train you. You don't have to worry about the membership. You wouldn't take that offer. Wouldn't you want to be your best you you could be? And that's what God is doing in this season in your life right now. Things may be out of whack. You know, you may have that uh, feeling of discontent. You know, you may feel like things are just, um, you don't feel your purpose, anything like that. That may be God trying to. Um, make you whole, make you sit down and deal with some of those things that you've just been letting linger in. And that's been molding your decision making over the years. You know what I mean? That's the reason why you keep ending up in bad relationships. That's the reason why you can be up one minute and then broke the next minute, you know, because you haven't gained the knowledge of being a good steward over what you have, you know? So that's what God may be doing in your life right now. Listen, the time is of the essence. Like we're getting too old to keep playing, you know, titter tatting back and forth. Um, like I said last week, the Bible says God would rather for you to be hot or cold, but lukewarm is like, ugh, who wants that? So at some point of your life and how, how much calamity has to happen for you to say, Lord, I'm surrendered. You know, so the best thing you can do is to allow God to do a work in you. That's so beautiful. Like it's, it's, that's real, uh, soul food for the soul. You know what I mean? No matter how many drinks you have, no, how many, you know, black mouths or blunts or anything like that you take, you're still going to be empty. You're going to be broke. You're still going to be broken. So allow God to build you up. Take a pieces, like take apart all that stuff that you've clustered together over the years. Give it up. The unforgiveness, you know, the lack, you know, the wrong mindset, the attitudes of the heart. Give it up and he'll give he'll fill you back up. God will never leave you empty. I'll tell you that much. All right. If you look at the Bible, everyone that Jesus encountered, he multiplied in their life. He multiplied. He gave. You never hear anything about Jesus taking something from someone unless it was sickness or affirmity. All right. So God is a giving God. And what you are willing to sacrifice for God. Oh, listen, he will bless you in return. He will bless you multiple times in return for that. So I wrote a Facebook quote earlier this week. I said, any desire that you have that you're not willing to give it to God is an idol. It's an idol. Give it up. Give it up. You know, if that's the desire to be married, to be loved, and you keep going about it your own way, give it to God first so that he can give it back to you and whole something that's going to be long lasting. You know what I mean? So, um, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about the gift of faith. This is one of my favorites. Um, it says to be firmly persuaded of God's power and promises to accomplish his will and purpose and to display such a confidence in him and his and his word that circumstances and obstacles do not shape that conviction. If I can, um, again, parallel a face to the definition, you know, who would have this gift? Um, Job. We always talk about like how Job went through losing his children, losing his like all his business, his livestock, his health, like, you know, but he still trusts God in the midst of that. So the gift of faith is, like, is when things happen to people that we would be like, man, listen, I couldn't have gone through half of that. They have that gift of faith that says, listen, I know, I know my child may have died. You know, I know my son may have gotten shot. I know I may have lost my house to foreclosure. I know I may not have had a job for over a year, but I trust my convictions that God will come through for me, whichever way that means. So this is the gift of faith. That's someone who has faith beyond the normal, you know, saving grace type of faith. You know what I mean? Um, and the ways that we can use this gift is obviously through prayer. Um, you know, you can do 
Um, let's see, circumstances in which I know, for example, when my brother had gotten um, locked up, I seen my mom like praying, you know, and he was, you know, they was facing some heavy charges for him. And I, I will never forget, I seen my mom like praying like never before, you know what I mean? And, um, but she still had that like peace about his, his life, you know, like she didn't give up even when um, this sentence came back unfavorable in a sense, you know what I mean? So there are some people who, when things don't go their way, they out. They like, all right, God, I tried that God thing. I, what does it mean? I tried that God thing. You know, you get to a place in your spirituality when you start thanking God for some of the things that he withheld from you. You know what I mean? So I know there may have been people that you wanted or a job that you wanted and God said no to. But just because God may have said no to the no to you for that person or no to you for that God, um, that um that job doesn't mean that he's saying no to you to the desire of it. You know, it is the will of God, perhaps, for you to be married and to be whole, but maybe just not to that person. So make sure you draw a distinction between the two. All right. So that's the gift of faith. The gift of giving um, is to share what material resources or time you have with um, others cheerfully without the thought of return. Now, this is one of my spiritual gifts, and I'm going to tell you some do's and don'ts, all right? So I, because I can kind of relate to this one personally. Um, first of all, wait on God. Make sure you wait on God. Now, not in common sense situations. Hey, there's a flood going on. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, there's a flood. People are in need. Like, give. Be smart about how you give, but give. You know what I mean? But when you hear those people who are those repeat returners, I'll say, and they always got a story, you know, have discernment, wait on God to speak to you um, about giving whatever it is, because sometimes God may be trying to do something in their life and you may come and interrupt that plan. So now they're depending on you um, for provision now, you know. I always said, um, I, I used to joke around and you know how you riding up 95 and you'll see those big lottery signs. And I remember saying one day, like, oh man, if I hit the lottery for $700 million, um, I would do this. I would give this. And I, oh man, I helped my family out. And I remember God speaking to me just in something that simple. And he was like, mm, that's why you won't get it because you would be, um, pretty much messing up my plans. I'm working in all those people's life to trust me for provision. And here you come giving them this excerpt amount of money that's going to drive them mad. You know, some people still deal with like um, drug habits and things like that. They're going to take the whole community with them because now they got all these millions of dollars. So it's going to be more crime going up. You know what I mean? Um, you may lose loved ones. Like he reeled it in in depth for me. And I was like, oh, my God. All right. All right, Lord, I get it. But um especially with the gift of giving, you want to use your discernment, you know, pray. If God has given you the gift, God is responsible for leading and directing you too. too often. We don't want to wait around for that part. You, we just want to do it in our own strength, but then we start complaining when people use and abuse us. So that's why I said, let's be patient with this gift. Use your discernment and it's all for his glory. There's a difference between giving for God's glory and giving for your glory. I think we've all transparently enough have experienced giving and it feels good to say, hey, I gave, you know, you ever speak to somebody and out of their rage or frustration, they might say, you know what? And I helped her when she was, you know, down and I bought this for her kids and I did da 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 Well, this gift here says cheerfully and without the thought of return. But also, if I could add to this, without the thought of boasting about it. If God told you to give, first of all, it's not your provision. More than likely, God, those who have the gift of giving, God gives the increase to. So you're the ones that you always have extra because God trusts you to be an available vessel to help other people. That's why the extra isn't always for you. So that's why I was just saying, if 
Don't boast about giving any. If you're going to give to someone a boast about it, you might as well not give them and allow someone else to, you know, be a blessing in their life. So that's why I said there's a big difference between giving for your glory, because, of course, we all like those feel goods, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I gave to, you know, such and such. And, you know, do we are we doing that because of our heart? We have a genuine, you know, desire to help that person in need or are we doing it for the accolades in return? So, um, again, if this is God's gift and his prompting, he will supply, you know, he will supply the gift of exhortation. It says to come alongside of someone. With words of encouragement, comfort, consolation, and counsel to help them be all God wants them to be. Now, um, this is also one of my spiritual gifts. And that's when, let me see, that's your praise and worship leader in the front. You know, um, singing, you know, helping you to come before the throne of God, even when you don't feel it in your feelings still helping you usher to come to the throne of God, you know, so God can pour back into you. That's when you give someone an encouraging word when, you know, things is wrong and you say, hey, listen, all is going to be well. God still has you. You know what I mean? You still are in the palm of his hand. That's when you are um, using that gift of exhortation. And there's different ways you can do it. All those people who um, write online Facebook posts about scriptures and things like that constantly. That's them using their gift of exhortation, whether they know it or not. You know, somebody may come across that during a time and say, wow, God, that's confirmation. Or, wow, I really needed to hear that, you know. So don't stop doing what you're doing. Keep on doing, you know, whatever it is that you can do, you know, until God, um, you know, gives you another level of it or new direction of it. Do something. You shouldn't not you should not be doing anything. You know, the worst thing you can do is to have God give you a gift that you just sit on, that you just sit on, you know, that you allow to just lay dormant inside of you. Um, I remember when I first came to the body of Christ, when I was a believer, when I first became a believer, I... All those gifts that I'm talking about, the gift of giving, exhortation, knowledge, and, you know, um, wisdom... I didn't look at them as gifts. I looked at, you know, the pastor, his gift, you know, um, the preachers, all of them. But who, who, I'm, I, that's not for me to determine. There's no level of gift. They're all the same. You know how we say sin is sin? Well, gifts are gifts. In the eyes of God, just because you have the gift of pastor and a preaching doesn't make your gift above anybody else's. So, you know, again, don't compare your gifts to others. And I remember doing that when I first came. So I didn't value having the gift of administration, you know. So use your gifts how God see according for that, you know. And you should be doing something. There's no way you, should, you are in a church, especially for years, and you're just a member. You know, you should be using your gifts you should be developing your gifts. I don't care if you just helping out at the um, shout out to Mr. Washington over at Sharon Baptist. He has faithfully helped the parking lot ministry. Just making sure everybody is smooth, you know, because, you know, we we can still be a little, you know, rambunctious even in the church leaving and everything, you know. So but he used that gift every, you know, every week for both services. You know what I mean? Um and so that's why I said you is you should be I don't care my mom she faithfully goes to the church and cleans she cleans that's her gift she cleans up you know and she do it she serve God through her gift that's what it's all about serving God do your work unto the Lord meaning when you're at work yeah I know your boss listen you might not like your boss I might not like your boss all right but guess what when you commit your work to God you said Lord you've given me this gift so and this gift is making room for me meaning I'm profiting off my ability to teach or I'm profiting off my ability to do whatever let me commit and submit my works to you and I know things may be unfair I know I might do more work than the other teachers I may stay longer you know I, I help more students than they do but guess Guess what? 
you're not accountable to them. You're accountable to God. God sees your effort. God sees everything you're doing. So don't think for one second that God isn't going to bless you in return, you know? And that's why, you know, um, he's giving you the position. That's why he'll give you the position instead of them sometimes, you know, because he can trust your character. He can trust that in the midst of the storm and in the midst of things going wrong at your job, you're the only one who's still doing what's right in the manner of what's right and wrong, you know? So at the end of the day, I always say it's all about character as well. That's why it's all of our purpose, no matter what gift it is, is we all still have the same purpose, which is to be molded and conformed in the image of God. The, pe the preachers, the pastors, the apostles, the evangelists, we may have different gifts and they may look differently in our lives, but through the same spirit, the goal is still the same for us to glorify God and to look like Christ. That's it. You know, um, work on our heart work on our heart issues. So the next gift is the gift of discernment. Now I want to say something first about this gift. Some people have this gift. Charnette has this gift. All right. Charnette will call me at four or five o'clock in the morning and be like, listen, I was in prayer and the Lord, you know, some, listen, be careful with such and such and such. This is her gift. But I want to say something. This is something we can also pray for as well. We may not necessarily pray that we have the gift of discernment, but we can ask God for discernment in a situation. You know what I mean? Um, business, sometimes in um, different business dealings, I got to say, Lord, give me discernment to let me know if I'm making the right decision or something. No matter how smart you think you are, you can never ask God enough for his opinion or like his help or his direction, uh, which will save you a lot more time, heartache, mistakes, and money. Trust me, take it from me. Okay. So definitely you want to, um, you may not have the gift of discernment or you may, but even for those who don't, you can ask God for a discerning spirit, you know, for, um, discernment in that situation you may be going through. So the definition for the gift of discernment is to clearly distinguish truth from error by judging whether the behavior or teaching is from God, Satan, human error, or human power. You know, I remember over the years I've encountered, um, I used to have a business on Willen Avenue. I used to have a check cashing place. And there was a lot of um, people from different countries that would come in and they would tell me stories about like spiritual wickedness in a sense. And they would say, you know, well, in this country, we believed if you were albino, that you were a demon or like you were of something of the um, devil. Or um, we believe that you would sacrifice this child for this, like the spirit of discernment. You ask God for discernment against those type of things. You know, if somebody's come to you and you say, and they say, Hey, thus say of the Lord said for me to receive a thousand dollars from you. So listen, I didn't hear that. All right. I got to ask the Lord. <laughs> I got to ask the Lord for discernment. So in other words, be wise about the situations that you encounter and get yourself into the gift of evangelism. What's my time? Okay. The gift of evangelism. To be a messenger of the good news of the gospel. We all have this gift. Um, the Great Commission instructs us all to be ambassadors for Christ, I'll say, you know. But there are some who um, go out. These are our missionaries that we'll see in different countries, you know, who's risking their lives to bring the love the mercy, the grace of Christ to people that um, don't know him, you know, so and um, keep those people in prayer. You know, we that's why I say you never want somebody else's gift. You know, it's funny. I see a lot of people. They they like the gift of pastor and, and the allure and prosperity that perhaps come with that. But you never see anybody running to the, the other countries to save people, you know what I mean? To be uncomfortable, you know, to sleep in a hut for a couple months, you know what I mean? Um, to be without technology, you know, we don't run towards that type of stuff for some reason. So um, I always try to keep those who are going 
to places and things like that when they're away from their families. I try to keep them in prayer as much as possible for protection and um, encouragement, you know. They see a lot of different stuff, you know. Um, there's another gift, the gift of celibacy, you know. Um, to voluntarily remain single without regret and with the ability to maintain control, sexual impulses, so as to serve the Lord without distractions. This is a gift that Paul had. You know, even Apostle Paul said, listen, it's better not to be married. You get much more work done for the Lord, you know, because you won't have the weight, the distractions and things like that. And um, sometimes you can be given this gift in a certain season of your life. You know what I mean? Um, I always say if there was a time I wish I would have used more of my youthful years um, and before I had children or in, in, before I got married or things like that to use that time more effectively for God, you know, um, I feel like I could have used that time more wisely. But if you have the gift of, um, you know, withholding in that area, you know, you continue to stay encouraged. That's where God has you. And you continue to do the work that the Lord has for you. That's what's true fruit, you know, what you're doing. The gift of tongues to speak in a language not previously learned. So unbelievers can hear God's message in their own language or the body be edified. You know, remember in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit first fell on them and there were people, um, who were not of the language that they heard the gospel in their own language and was like, wait, how do these guys know our language? Like they're Jews, you know? So, um, tongues is real for some people, you know, they, their tongues is activated. Mine's is not activated, but, um, again, that's something that the Holy spirit works through you. The interpretation of tongues, because see, speaking tongues and interpreting tongues go hand in hand. You got to have somebody speaking, but you also have to have someone interpreting what's being spoken. It says um, to translate the message of someone who has spoken in tongues, pretty much hospitality to warmly welcome people, even strangers into one's home or church as a means of serving those in need of food or lodging. You know who was good at this ministry? Uh, my grandmother, Regina Wallace at 332 West Queen Lane in Germantown. I would come home from school and there would be all kinds of people at our house. All right. <laughs> Grandma ain't have no business saying, come on in, baby. Here's a meal. You know, here's some clothes. Can you fit these here? There was time she'd give away my clothes and shoes to other <laughs> You know, little girls my size, you know. So, so Grandma, she had that gift of hospitality. She uh, volunteered at um, the soup kitchen for over 30 years, didn't get paid for it. But guess what? She was there as an available vessel for God to minister to the homeless, the battered women, you know. And she was there working for God all those years. She loved what she did, but it was never work to her. It was never work. She loved what she did, and she genuinely had a heart for the people who came into her life, you know. So, um, and this gift is displayed, like, when you go to church and you see the greeters, you know, um, or those who are in the welcome lounge or visitor's lounge, this gift is um, someone just being hospitable, you know, towards the people who comes in the church or in your life, you know. Um, the helps ministry, to render support or assistance to others in the body, so as to free them up for ministry. This is if you have someone who may come into the church and they might say, you know what, pastor, don't worry about that paperwork. I'll go ahead and file the paperwork for you or I'll, you know, um, I'll take care of this. I'll, I'll pay the bills, you know, administratively and things like that. Again, um, as I mentioned, um, a good friend of mine, Mr. Washington, he's a, he does the parking lot ministry. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, we look at that, um, and we may not see any allure to that, but it's not for our glory. It's all for God's glory, you know? And that's when you get to a mature season and experience with God and your relationship. You know, it's not, it's like when you are invited to the king's house. It's not always about sitting at the table. 
Sometimes you might want to get there a little early just to make sure he needs any help, you know? Some people like to just come in and be served, you know. Oh, where do I get my seat? Make sure I'm seated closer to the, um, you know, the king. It's not about that. At the end of the day, I, I can only hope that you commit to doing that hurt, that heart, that heart work. You know, this week I posted, uh, um, I posted on Facebook that said, "What's the difference between being saved and being born again?" You know. And um, basically, the difference is you can be saved. Yes, your soul will be saved. You'll go to heaven. But there's so much more than just going to heaven. You know, what? what's the point of, like, devoting your whole life down here and only to get to heaven and pretty much be with someone for the rest of your life that you haven't gotten to know? It's like an arranged marriage in a sense. You know what I mean? So I say take this time to know God while you're down here. So when you do die and go to heaven, it's like just a re, um, just being reunited, you know. It's like, wow, God, you know, I get to spend my time with you. It's fellowship. Um, being born again is when you start to do that heart work, when your heart desires change. You're not the same person. Yeah, when you was first saved, you just came out of the world. But to be born again is when you commit that, Lord, I want my heart to look like yours. When your prayer life even changed, you're not even, you're not even praying for yourself that much. You're praying for everybody and everything that concerneth your heavenly father. So again, um, it's my desire that all of us never get comfortable with just being saved. Just being saved is 10% of the work. It's the other 90 that you allow God to do in you and through you, you know, for the sake of other people. So that was the gift of helps, um, the gift of an apostle to be sent forth to new frontiers, new territories with the gospel, providing leadership over church bodies and maintaining authority over spiritual matters pertaining to the church. Um, apostle Paul, we call him apostle Paul. Basically, um, and a lot of, you see a lot of apostles be church planters, you know, they have the grace to pretty much go to different places and put together a body of Christ. It's not always about a building. You know, this week I, I came across a video that really, really kind of changed my perspective on American Christianity. You know, too often we look at other countries as if they're poor. Yes, they may not have the same level of prosperity we have, but guess what? They're so rich in spirit. They're so rich in spirit. And I feel like American Christianity has been so diluted, you know? And it's more like we, we become so vain. It's more than just what church you go to. I'll go to that big church on a hill. It's more than that. You know, back then they didn't, listen, they didn't even have... They didn't have a building to go to. They were mean at each other's homes. But guess what? I can only imagine that they felt so filled. They felt so filled, you know? So I, I can only hope that we get back to that place of genuine, genuine fellowship where you can't wait to go to, you know, that's why small groups are very important as well, you know? Um, because, you know, we go to church and Sometimes we still have that isolated mindset. You know, I'm going to just go get my word. I ain't talk to nobody. I ain't in nobody. I'm in nobody in my business. I ain't in nobody else's business, you know. But you're missing the point of being there. You're missing the point of being there. It's not always about you, your emotions and your feelings and your experiences and things have happened. That's the purpose of you being in fellowship with God throughout the week. So he can continue to heal you from all that stuff. So when you get to the church, you're not carrying all that stuff, you know. So um, that's the gift of apostle. Administration, one of my other gifts, um, to steer the body towards the accomplishment of God-given goals and directives by planning, organization, and supervising others. Um, again, these are the people that you, you know, may see working at the church, you know, these are the Christian leaders and Christian edu I mean, Christian education, um, someone working at the colleges and things like that. Someone who's using their administrative gifts to um, help the body of Christ, in other words.
the gift of healing to be used as a means through which God makes people whole, either through physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual healing. Now, this gift is tricky. It's a difference between having the gift of healing and being a healer. See, a healer implies that you're constantly healing. No, with this gift, it's up to the Holy Spirit to decide who gets healed. You know, there may be some people that you may go to pray for or lay hands on or try to anoint them. And God's answer is yes, no, wait, or my grace is sufficient enough. You know, um, the apostle Paul, he prayed for, um, he said he had a thorn in his flesh. He said he tried to pray against it. And God said, my grace is sufficient enough. So it's not when we, those who have that gift of healing, you know, it's a thin line to know who's doing the healing and who determines who get healed and don't have too much high expectations for the healers. Anyway, that, you know, Sometimes our expectation on people sometimes push people over the edge a little bit more, you know? So, um, I remember my mom, she just had a double mastectomy and, um, she just fought breast cancer. And I thank God for the gift of healing because we prayed and he heard our prayers. And there's some people that died of breast cancer and they weren't healed. Or there's some people who was healed or several times, and then, you know, it came back or something like that, you know? So I'm just grateful um, to still have my mom during this time of my life, you know? Um, no one has all the gifts. Only one person had all the gifts, and that was Jesus. No one has all the gifts. At the minimum, we have one. At the minimum, we have one. There is something called the five-fold ministry, and usually that's when... Um, someone has the gift of teaching, pastoring, evangelist, prophet, and being an apostle. But usually, again, these are the church planters, the, um, the pastors and things like that, because they need those extra gifts to operate. You know what I mean? Imagine having a pastor and he can't exhort, encourage other people. So the Holy Spirit was strategic to, you know, have the five fold ministry, um, there's a difference. I'm going to go over this. There's a difference between being a prophet. A prophet is someone who takes the word from God to the people. A priest is someone who takes the word from the people to God. So, um, I just wanted to, you know, kind of be clear about that. Um, the greatest feeling is to be used by God. I remember there was times in my life where God would ask me to do something that I didn't really want to do, you know? Um, I remember just getting out of season where I, I was, um, broke. I was broke and the Lord had sent some money in my life and I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm back up. All right. And I went to church and I'm sitting there and the Lord was like, give every cent of it for your first fruit offering. And I was like, oh no, I ain't. <laughs> they won't be getting this. Listen, I tithe, but I ain't giving this extra. This is mine, you know? And I just got out of that, um, that season where, you know, I just didn't have. So I was being extra clingy. So the service is still going on. And this is when you know it's God because your flesh don't want to, the, the, the Bible says your flesh is hostile to the things and the ways of God. So, um, my flesh is thinking like, man, you know, I could do this with that. I could do this and this, you know, I don't know. Next time you might come across this kind of money. So I remember really wrestling with my flesh, like, Lord, I want to obey you, but really do I have to give all of it up? You know, <laughs> in addition to my ties, make a long story short. Um, I wrote every cent of it. I wrote out a check for every cent of it. And um, I remember I got in the car and I remember like, what did I do? But I had to trust God and God was just teaching me like, don't get attached to the provision. Be attached to the provider because the provision will change. How would you act when you living off of $20 a week versus, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month, 
you know? So God is all about the character building, not making you comfortable all the time. So I remember to wrap that story up, a few months go past and God did something for me that in a million years, I would never have thought like how he would have worked it out for me and make a long story short. I, um, I can't say I will never question him again because that'll be a lie. But that helped me grow in my relationship with him because I will always have that to draw back to, to say, all right, I remember you told me you blessed my obedience. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. All right. So um, I always say the greatest gift is the feeling of being um, used by God. I sit here with you guys every Friday and... You know, sometimes it's like weird for me because he blessed me so much, you know, and not just financially, but he blessed me so much with, you know, wisdom and knowledge and things like that. And I don't know everything, but I also remember like, why me? I'm the high school dropout, Lord. You know, why me? I'm the one that said, you know, she would be pregnant and wouldn't make it out of Germantown, you know? Um... I was the one that was in eighth grade on a third grade reading level. But that's the MO of God. You know, he takes the one that's unlikely to succeed and make them successful through him. So don't always despise your upbringing, your educational level, some of the things that may have happened to you your setbacks, don't always despise that because if God had allowed it to happen, he has a plan for it. You know, God, he is, listen, he's the only one I know that can recycle somebody's entire life, like all the bad stuff and everything, you know, all the indifferent stuff. He's the only one that I know that can recycle someone's life and give it back to them as if more better than when they thought they were doing it in their own strength, you know? Um, and then I look at my life, I give, but I remember always being the taker. Oh, I took everything, every chance I could. I took, I took, I took, I took, you know, out of my own survival needs, I took. And now I thank God for bringing me to a place where I'm comfortable not taking anymore because I know my God provides for me. And I like when he provides for me. It makes me feel comfortable. You know, it's like, it's a big weight off of me. You know, I'm not saying, hey, sometimes, you know, you start like, oh, Lord, you sure you got me? You know, but it feels good to know that, you know, see, God knows he's going to take care of you. It feels good to know. Make sure you know that God will take care of you. Even when it looks like he's not going to come through. You know how many times God has come through for me? Like at the nick of timing, or matter of fact, even after the time of expiration, because remember, God is the author of time. Who am I to put a time on when he should provide for me? You know, so there may be times when your bills may be late. Guess what? God will still show you grace and favor in that. How do you use your gifts? The Bible tells us to use our gifts in love. And in service to others. Your gifts are for everybody else. Your gifts are for you, everybody else. Every church needs believers with all kinds of gifts to serve and build up the body of Christ. So you can serve at your church. If you don't go to a church, guess what? There are plenty of volunteer opportunities near you. All right? Um, women, be careful. You know, I encounter some women who seek out to do some, you know, some things by themselves. So just be careful, take somebody with you. Um, by no means am I instilling fear in you, but be wise. All right. And, um, again, take somebody with you. God only gives you the grace to handle your gifts. As I said before, you know, don't wait, don't want anyone else's gift. You know, as I always tell people, don't want no one, don't want anyone else's spouse neither. You know, they might drive you crazy, you know, but that person had the, the grace to deal with that. So the same thing with gifts. Don't desire anyone else's gifts because that shows 
that you're doing it all for you and not God, you know, be a good steward over what God gives you. I always say that, you know, um, be confident in the God in you. Now, there's a lot of times where I wanted to do like, I try to, I'm like, all right, Lord, how do I give? Like, how do I give? So there'd be times where, um, and thank you, Mr. Eddie, for this suggestion. I would like go to Dunkin' Donuts and get like a $5 gift card. Um, so that way I know, you know, all homeless people, they would love or whoever in need would um, love hot coffee, you know, in a sandwich or donut or something, you know, so you, oh, you don't always have to give money. Um, so I would give like, you know, the gift cards and I would attach some scripture to it or the prayer of salvation. Even if I would just pump and gas a Wawa and the person next to me, I may bless them with the envelope. They don't know what's in it. You know, um, there's different ways you can use your gift of giving or however, whatever your gift is, you know, just, um, just start using them, you know, be wise, but don't be one of those people that's like, oh, I got to wait for, you know, God. And therefore you're leaning on that for an excuse more so than, um, you following what God has told you to do kind of, you know, or just following common sense. Once you start doing something, you know, you'll start to, I always say ministry teaches you to mature, but if you don't commit yourself to a ministry, you know, you'll just stay where you are, you know? So be confident in the God in you, your gifts are for others. And I think, um, well, it says don't export God's gifts. It says your gifts will make room for you. That's so true. Um, when you love what you do, when I'm here, I love the word of God. You know, I don't know everything, but what I do know, I try to apply it as much as possible. And the second part is that is because I love you guys enough that I will sacrifice my, you know, Friday nights with you guys teaching you the word of God, you know, and just praying for you guys and hoping that it steers something up in you that maybe you'll go use your gifts to bless someone else. It's all about reciprocating, reciprocating um, time and time again to someone else, you know, um, never get um, sidetracked with like not wanting to encounter people. You know, we're in that generation where everybody want to be alone. You know, I always say, I used to think like that, you know, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to be around now with those people. And, you know, I, I, I bang with myself. I rock by myself. I don't need no friends, you know, but when you are a good person and you know, God has been doing a lot, like you want to be around people. You want people to feel, you know, and have partake in you, you know, um, only people who are still broken think like that. I don't want nobody. I don't want to be around nobody. I don't, I don't have no friends who boast about not having no friends. Like, come on. Like, I know we might, you know, do that as a, dis, um, defense mechanism, but who boasts? I used to bra brag about that kind of stuff, but when God, I allow him to do work in me. And I'm like, wow, God, like you start to develop a heart, his heart for people. So naturally you want to be around people and help them, you know, use your gifts. You know, there's a lot of people who encounter my life that, you know, I help them. I use my gifts, whether it's me opening up a business for them, grant writing, you know, whatever it is, helping them, you know, if I got to go to a uh, house that they want to buy with them and, you know, see if it's a good fit for them, whatever my, my wisdom, whatever it is, you can't encounter that until you encounter people, you know? So don't be so quick to hide from interacting with people because they have something that will bless your life. Probably even if it's just their time and ministering to you through your hurt, um, and things like that, you know, God will, God will remove his anointing, but not the gift. And we've seen that in the, um, in Saul, not Saul, um, the, the King Saul, he had the anointing, but then it fell off, but he was still the King, you know, look at the devil. Guess what? He still has his gifts. <laughs> of course, he's not anointed, but he still has his gifts. So you may be saved, you may be backslidden, you know, um, but you still have your gifts. God isn't an Indian giver, you know, even if you're not using them, you're going to be accountable for that, but you still have your gifts, stir up your gifts. You know, the apostle Paul, I love what he says. He says, fan into flames, your gift. And all I think about is 
um, a fan spinning and like, you know, there's a torch and all the little fires, like pieces of fire just going different places in the world. Do you know what I mean? So fan into flames your spiritual gifts so God can use you, use your life. Um, as I said, it's your responsibility to develop your gift. Iron sharpens iron, the Bible says. So you have to, if you have the gift for preaching or pastoring, you should be around those like-minded individuals to teach you, you know, um, how to do that. You know, you're not going to learn it on your own. You know, everything that I've learned, you know, um, well, a lot of it was through trial and error, you know, and God being gracious enough to, you know, but at least I had the willing spirit to attempt to try to do something. You know, the one thing that kind of is a pet peeve a little bit is someone who don't try to do nothing, you know, and sometimes they, the ones who got the most, um, criticism for everybody else. Who's at least trying to succeed, at least trying to open a business, at least trying to be a good dad, at least trying to, you know, um, walk in the ways of God. So at least be one of those people that will at least try to do something, you know? Don't judge everybody else. Um, the more you bring your flesh under subjection, the easier it is to be used. You know, as I was describing to you guys earlier, there are times when, you know, it's gonna, it seems like it's hard to walk the will of God or walk with God sometimes, but... The more you allow him to change your heart is not that hard because now your heart is like his heart. You desire the same thing he desires. Now you have a desire to help the widow, the homeless, you know, the brokenhearted, you know, to get people saved, to love, to be giving. Like now you have a desire for that. If you still have the desires of the world in you to, you know, um, be swayed by your sexual pleasures and things like that to lie still cheat all that kind of stuff of course it's going to be hard to do all the previous things i just listed you know so the more that you get your heart into um tech the more you'll be able to allow god to use you and it'll be it's a good feeling trust me like it's a good feeling i've i can't even explain it you know it's something and it counts for eternity you know People going to use you all day. You know, there's people who use you for your knowledge. You had that one coworker who, you know, you, she's, she knows that you know everything. So she keep coming to you, stealing your ideas, you know, to present them as her own. You know, you're going to have others use you for your body. You may have some use you financially. But when God, when God uses your life, that counts for eternity. You know, that counts for eternity. Relationships are important to God, you know. Um, don't be so quick to throw everybody away. You know, I thank God for the people who have had patience with me over the years, um, who's forgiven me for anything I may have done. Um, the same way as God has forgiven you, I can only hope that you will allow someone else to experience you forgiving them. Because forgiveness is of God. You know, that's that's God-like character when you forgive and you love. Because those things don't come naturally with our flesh. Our flesh tell us you got every reason not to forgive. And matter of fact, retaliate while you can, you know. So, as I said, the goal in all of this is to continue to allow God to love you in those places where you're not whole completely. You know, continue to allow God to do a work in your life. So ultimately, he can do a work in your children's life, in your marriage, you know, in your ministry, on your job. It's not always just about you. It's about everyone else, too, who's around you. We are a community of believers. So I, um, I hope that was all the gifts. I hope somewhere along the lines that you heard your gift. Again, it's your job. And go listen, we thank God for Google, all right? Um, Google or it's talk to your pastor or you should, everybody should have at least one spiritual friend, you know, ladies, this invitation is for the ladies, ladies. All right. If you need someone to talk to, if you need someone to, you know, um, however way I can use any of my gifts, you know, feel free to send me an inbox or give me a call or something. All right.
I love you guys. Um, before we leave, I'm going to pray, and I hope you enjoy your weekend. Again, keep the people in prayer over in Florida, and um, let's just hope that there's no more, um, no more disaster. Like, we've had enough, you know? Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, for everyone who may be listening or watching. Father God, I pray a special hedge of protection around them and their children and their loved ones, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, for forgiving us for our sins. I pray for anyone who's not saved or who do not know you for the pardon of their sins, Lord God. Um, I pray even right now, Lord God, that you use us. Teach us our spiritual gifts and give us creative ways to use them all for your glory, Lord God. If there's someone who's using their gifts um, exploitively, Lord God, I ask that you teach them, Lord God, and forgive them, but teach them the right way to do things. Father God, in Jesus' name, I just pray that you just continue to um, be with us and draw us closer to you. Amen. All right. I love you guys. Have a good weekend. See you next Friday. Bye.